Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is for the uh, final exam, the practice final in Behavioral Science 3010, Statistics for the Behavioral Sciences at Utah Valley University. This is the uh, part six, and we're going to start with question 45 on the exam. This one says, if we use alpha as the criteria, excuse me, if we use alpha as the criteria or critical value for the maximum probability of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis, which is a rather convoluted phrase, then when the p-value is less than alpha, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Um, the alpha is the probability of getting a false positive. The idea here is that you have a null distribution. It's like a bell curve. And you're willing to accept a certain amount of variation just through random chance. And while it is possible that even extreme variation can occur through random chance, you, you usually set off the highest and lowest parts of the distribution and say, well, if it gets way out here, then we're going to, I'm not gonna, willing to accept it as just plain old randomness, but it's probably due to something else. That is your alpha region, and it's usually 5% of the total distribution, 2.5% on the top, 2.5% on the bottom. And even though something can get in there by accident, and that would be a false positive, um, it's more likely that it's there because there really is, for instance, a difference between the groups or a correlation between variables. Um, and so the p-value here, uh, that refers to the statistic you get from your samples. So, for instance, you're comparing a sample mean to a population. You do a z-test. You get a, a z-score for the sample of, like, uh, z equals plus 3. And the probability of getting a z-score that far away from 0 uh, by random chance is extremely small. It's less than 1% of the time. So the p-value, for instance, would be 0 0.01. Uh, the alpha, on the other hand, the false positive rate in the null hypothesis that you're willing to accept is 0.05, 5%. And so the p-value of 01 is less than the alpha, the false positive rate of 05. And when that happens, uh, we look at our options here. The null hypothesis is retained, not rejected? No, because this uh, value is too extreme uh, to be reasonably attributed to chance variation. The null hypothesis is true? Well, no, uh, because we have a very unusual value. Besides, you can never prove the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is rejected. Yes, that is the correct answer, C. When you get a p-value uh, from your sample data that is smaller than the alpha, and the alpha is usually 0, 05, if you get a p-value that's smaller than that, then you reject the null hypothesis and say, you know, even though this could arise through random chance, it's so unusual, I'm willing to say that's not likely, it's not going to happen, it's probably something else. And so you reject the null hypothesis. And this last one, the data set was incorrectly interpreted, you know, that, that's neither here nor there. So anyhow, that's that. 46. A researcher conducts two studies on relational satisfaction with the same independent and dependent variables. So imagine they're doing an experiment. After conducting a two-sample t-test, that's a test that you use to compare the means of two different groups, study A was found to have an effect size of 0.65. Um, they're, let's assume they're using something like Cohen's D, which looks at the standardized difference between group means. So we have, a, we have an effect size of 0.65 and a p-value of 0 0.0001. So this is, a, uh, this is very much a statistically significant finding. Study B was found to have an effect size of 6.5 also, and a p-value of 0.76. So it's got the same effect size, but a very different p-value. Which study had the smaller sample size? Okay, now here's the deal. Larger sample sizes lead to smaller p-values. That is, a larger sample will be more likely to be statistically significant, because uh, it's less likely to get these, this amount of variation in a larger sample. Just the same way, if you flip a coin 100 times and you get 70 heads, that's more surprising than if you flip a coin 10 times and get 70 heads. So the idea here is study A has, the, has a much smaller probability value. It's much less likely to get uh, that effect size in study A. So that's the larger sample. Study B has the same effect size, but a much uh, its p-value is much, you know, is bigger, and it's it's not statistically significant by the standard 05. So B has a smaller sample. So A study A no study A must have a bigger sample. B yes study B has a has the smaller sample. So B is the correct answer. Uh, C the samples were the same size. No, they're not. Uh, if you know if they have the same effect size. And, this, and they have the same sample size, they should have the same p-value, which is not the case here. 
and you cannot infer sample size from the information given. Well, you can't give an you can't give an exact value, but you can make a relative statement. And anyhow, B is the correct answer. Study B. 47. A researcher conducts two studies on depression severity with the same independent and dependent variables. Don't forget, independent means the cause or the manipulated variable, and dependent is the outcome variable that's affected by or depends on the independent variable. Study A had a sample size of 500, and the p-value was calculated at 002. All right. Study B also had a sample size of 500, and the p-value was calculated at 033. So same sample sizes but different p-values. Which study had the smaller effect? Okay, remember, um, now we're holding the sample size constant. The larger um, effect will have the smaller p-value. Similarly, the smaller uh, effect will have the larger p-value. They're negatively related. And so which one had the smaller effect size? We're looking for the one with the bigger p-value. Well, that's study B, because it's at 033. That's a bigger value than the 002 on the other one. So study B is the answer. Study A, no. Study Again, it's B, study B. Uh, the effect sizes were not the same, no, because we, otherwise we would have the same p-values. That's not the case. And you cannot infer effect size from the information given. Again, it can't tell you exactly what the effect size was, but you can make a relative statement. So the answer, again, is B. 48. The effect size is calculated as D equals 0.89. What does this mean? Now, D usually means Cohen's D, which is used to compare the means of two groups to each other or the mean of a sample to a population. And it tells you how far the means are from each other in standard deviation units. It's very similar to a z-score in that way. Uh, let's see here. D is 89. Uh, A is 89% of predictions will be incorrect. Well, that's ridiculous. That, that 89 has nothing to do with that. 0.89% of the samples will have a lower score than the population. Um, you know, you can sometimes make inferences about distribution and stuff like that, but I think that one's just nonsense, especially because it's 0.89, so it's less than 1%. That's ridiculous. C, the sample mean is 0.8 standard, 0.89 standard deviations away from the population mean. Yes, this is correct, um, because D is measuring distances between means in units of standard deviations. And then uh, D, the null hypothesis is retained. Well, I don't know anything about that because we don't know the sample size, and so we can't get the p-value. So C is the correct answer. When D is equal to 0.89, the sample mean is 0.89 standard deviations away from the population mean. Another question on Cohen's D. 49, if Cohen's D equals 2.25, then which of the following is always true? Uh, a, the population and sample means are very similar. No, they're not. They're two and a quarter standard deviations away from each other. So A is not true. B, there are 2.25 standard deviations between the two sample means. Um, yes, that is correct. Um, that, that's the meaning of it. Again, Cohen's D is measuring how many standard deviations uh, there are between means. It's very similar to Z-scores. So B is correct. C that the test was statistically significant. Now that depends on the sample sizes. So we don't we don't we can't get a p-value because we don't have the sample size information. And D that the sample sizes were very large. You know that that's that that's neither here nor there. That's a that's a totally separate issue because D specifically removes the effect of sample sizes. So anyhow, 49 is B. If if Cohen's D is equal to 2.25, then that means that there's 2.25 standard deviations between the two sample means. All right. 50. If Cohen's D is very small, uh, the two means are blank each other. Uh, if Cohen's D is very small, again, it's measuring how many standard deviations there are between the means. So if it's very small, the two means are A, far apart? No, because that's, that's, the, that's the opposite. B, causing each other? No, Cohen's D has nothing to do with causality. Um, you have to have an association for causality, but uh, the causality has to do with the design of the study, not with the actual statistic here. So that's nothing else. So B is irrelevant. Uh, C, the two means are close to each other. Yeah, if, if Cohen's D is small, then there's not many standard deviations between the samples. So the two means are close to each other. So C is the correct answer. And of course, none of the above, uh, that's not true. Okay, and we'll stop right there for this section, and we'll pick up with uh, question 51.